Hello, my name is David Thorpe and I'm the special correspondent on Sustainable Cities Collective, the foremost web space for urban leaders everywhere. And we have today with us Stéphane Dupin, who is the project manager for Imagine Low Energy Cities. This is a pan-European initiative led by the European Network of Local Authorities, Energy Cities, and supported by the European Commission. Launched in 2012, it's intended to get cities to think and act differently about energy. And Stefan is here to explain progress so far. Hello, Stefan. Hi, David. Pleased to have you here today. Now, first, can you begin by telling us what differentiates the Imagine campaign from others that are to do with sustainable development and cities? Um, we tried uh, through this project to uh, to bring cities to think in long in terms of uh, long terms. Uh, that means uh, we have tried uh, with our city partners to uh, develop um, roadmaps at the horizon 2050 uh, in each of the par uh, participating cities. Uh, in order really to for them to uh, get over the daily problems and uh, the short-term issues. Uh, the idea was to get rid of that and to really uh, get people to start thinking long-term. Uh, the other thing was uh, that we also focused a lot on how cities could involve uh, local stakeholders within uh, the thinking of uh, uh, the energy future of 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 territories um, and in that sense uh, we I think that's a bit uh, what makes us uh, special as uh, we really uh, focus on ways for cities uh, to get into a dialogue with uh, with citizens with uh, enterprises uh, any local actors that could have a role to play on, on energy issues uh, and the third thing would be that uh, we um, we had the ambition to uh, to really make that project political, which is often not the case with uh, with uh, European funded projects, which are of quite often quite uh, technical projects. So, if, how yeah. many cities have you got involved in the project? Uh, eight cities. cities are all cities uh, which are members of uh, Energy Cities Network. Uh, in Denmark, uh, we have Odense, which is, uh, I think, the second or the third largest city in, in, in the country. In France, it's the city of Lille in north of France. In Germany, uh, w the participating city was uh, Munich, uh, which is quite a leading city uh, in that field. Uh, in the UK, uh, it's uh, a city near London, uh, Milton Keynes, which is uh, a new city. Uh, quite interesting to see actually. Uh, in Bulgaria it's uh, a city uh, in the east of the country called Dobrich. In Romania it's uh, cit uh, the city called uh, Bistrica and uh, in Spain in Catalonia it was Figueres and it in Italy uh, Modena. I see. Now you, you mentioned that it's, uh, it's got a political dimension to it. Do you uh, think the cities at present have sufficient administrative control for themselves over the relevant policy areas to take the steps that you're asking them to take? And if not, what powers, extra powers, do you think they should have? Uh, well, I have to say it really depends on the country's uh, situation. Uh, that's always a, that's one of the problems we had during the project because we were talking about totally different political situations. What would be really good for cities is to have direct uh, competencies on energy issues, but that's often not the case. Um, often, um, often cities also lack the possibilities to impose, for example, energy efficiency rules which are set at, at the national level. But if you take an ex example, if you want to compare some countries, if you take countries like uh, Germany uh, or countries in the north of Europe, in Scandinavia, they all often have really good possibilities to uh, take control of uh, energy production, energy supply. Uh, the the, the, the well-known case is the uh, Stadtwerk in, in Germany, where really cities do have big parts well, not all the cities, but there are many cities which have which are directly parts into the uh, energy production companies at local level. 
This is also one of the possi the reason why, for example, Munich could say we we want to go for 100% renewable uh, energy for electricity. Um, often, yeah, as I said, often uh, cities are refrained uh, to take action by national level and f by EU rules. Uh, another example for sustainability or for energy issues is, for example, uh, the, the simple rule as of competition. If you want to say we want to go local and regional, uh, some rules might uh, impeach you to, uh, to take, for example, the, the um, a provider or an, an external expertise at the local level because it could be uh, maybe cheap somewhere else in Europe which actually doesn't really make sense when you talk about energy issues uh, so one of the things that we often say at energy city is that uh, at least cities should have the right to experiment things and often there are rules that uh, doesn't allow that and uh, yeah and that's a general thing that we want to promote that at energy cities within our network is to say that uh, at least cities should be consulted and um, it's also something that we discussed during our the final event of our project uh, this theme of multi-level governance uh, it's not only about what powers lies where but it's often uh, the topic is often to look at how cooperation is made between the different uh, levels of decisions. Yes, now, so you've made um, 30 proposals for the energy transition of cities and towns. Now, one of them is to make the planning system uh, a driver of the territory's energy transition. Can you give me good examples of, of cities that are going down this path? Mm. It's not a very easy uh, proposal to make examples for um, because it's a very transversal issue. Uh, however, the, for us it's very important to underline that because it really is the link to get out of the technical uh, solutions and for us energy is really not a technical issue but more uh, a, techni a political issue a social issue and planning if you take uh, if you take a territory uh, is really a tool that makes you um, be able to act in the end on energy issues without tackling directly energy issues <laughs> That's why we say that. Uh, that's why we wrote it as a proposal. Uh, there are cities that are foreigner into uh, this uh, field. For example, um, I, I went, I'm thinking of, of Munich, for example, which is a partner in the project, uh, which have a real a strong policy against uh, urban sprawl uh, at its own level. Uh, there are also I was also thinking of Figueres, which is also collaborating uh, with us as a pilot city. Who uh, is one of the first uh, Spanish cities who took, thanks to the project, the opportunity to um, include energy issues within uh, their renewal of their old urban planning uh, documents. And that's something I really think that was really. Uh, um, how to say? Um, yeah, exactly, and also uh, very interesting to to see that it is possible even even in countries where uh, you don't really have the opportunity for cities to take uh, part in the energy game at the yeah at national and and local level. There are other examples in our networks, uh, like Barcelona, for example, who also had this uh, three levels town planning, uh, which they which they use to uh, to really localize urban functions and make it in the end yeah if efficient to to go from one place to another and to uh, locate things in a way that uh, energy should be uh, used less uh, at the time at this present moment in time the price of energy is falling rather than rising Yet one of the proposals you've got is predicated upon constantly increasing prices. Is this a problem for you? And what might be the consequences of a falling energy price? Uh, it is not a problem in the sense that um, 
we are talking long term here uh, and energy prices are often uh, the results of many different factors which are very short term uh, factors if you look at um, if you look on a history basis of the uh, the evolution of, of energy prices you can really see that uh, it never went down for long uh, I mean, energy is finite. Uh, energy is going to be costing more and more, uh, and on the long term, prices are increasing. And also, most of um, most important for us is also to th to say that uh, uh, at least, for example, for fossil fuels in Europe, uh, because we are a European network, uh, these prices are just not in our hands. So we are saying that uh, it is it is uh, an issue of thinking in terms of long-term perspective, uh, thinking of a finite uh, resource. If we are talking about, for example, for renewable energies, we are happy that the prices are going down um, because uh, yeah, it makes it easier and more uh, marketable. Uh, and of course, one thing also for us to look at is yeah, what makes the energy price go down? Uh, are we is it artificial or is it just a market thing? And in in that sense, that for us a problem because that means that in the end someone has to pay for it, and uh, often yeah, the environmental costs are not taken into consideration, which uh, which is just simply not sustainable. Quite. Now, um, another problem that you might be facing is the fact that uh, Europe has been uh, and continues to be in in, re in recession um, as a whole. Uh, and many of the proposals that you've got involve capital expenditure because sometimes you have to spend first to save money later, for example, by installing a district heat vein in a region. So um, how can you persuade authorities to implement such spending in this very harsh climate, economic climate? Mm. Of course, it is always difficult to, uh, in that kind of, in the time of economic situation, to ask people to make big investments. Uh, what we try to convince uh, the cities are um, is that they are not just making investments to make investments, but uh, they they do invest in the local economy in the end. Um, our motto is to say, uh, keep the money home. That means any any money that you invest, if you invest this locally, it is better for for the local economy. Cities have to think where does where does the money go when they pay for energy? Uh, does does it goes for the wealth of their region of their territory, or does it go somewhere else where they have uh, no benefit for it in the end? So for us, yeah, it goes back to almost a philosophical uh, question: is uh, what is the public money for? Now, many staff in administrative bodies will need retraining to understand what you're asking them to do. Um, where, are they, where do you think they're going to find this training? Um, is there much institutional assistance for this kind of thing? Um, what I think is that the most important uh, skills that are needed at the um, level of the local authorities at the moment and in this uh, issue is we need experts in communication, experts in dialogue, for people to really be able to uh, to conduct a discussion with uh, with with the local actors and uh, make them able to uh, to really participate and co-create uh, things together. So and, this means, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the fact that there is this. I mean, you refer in your document to the bunker mentality that exists within departments at city level where people don't talk to each other from one department to another. So okay. is, that mean, is that to try and facilitate that sort of inter, you know, cross-departmental dialogue and get everybody on board? Well, that is exactly what happened within the pilot cities uh, during the project. Uh, and also this is something that we didn't really uh, expect, but it was one of the most uh, important side effects. Uh, People had to speak to their colleagues. Uh, they were suddenly put into a situation where they couldn't just do things on their own because they they needed uh, the inputs from the colleagues from the from the transport department from for the environment environmental departments all, all that kind of things. And I really think that's 
Um, I don't know if you can train that. <laughs> it is for me uh, that was really uh, a culture thing. Uh, that means that we have to, uh, to to train people to be able to look uh, at what their colleagues are doing and yes. uh, to really uh, involve them uh, into uh, into the works uh, that are transversal. And uh, in that sense. Um, I think it's more a cultural thing than uh, something else. It's a cultural thing, you're right. And, and in many cases, they need permission to do something a different way. For instance, the, the traditional barriers are between the politicians, the elected politicians, and between the civil servants, the public servants. And uh, they, they, they uh, often don't uh, even speak the same sort of language or technical or political language, do they? So, I mean, I'm thinking of, of retraining in that sense to, it can help to overcome uh, this cultural schism. Um, yeah, that's not the easy part. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, um, sure, uh, on the other side, they both need each other, uh, so they really have to find uh, ways to co cooperate. And again, we come. I think in this place, we really come down to uh, also to uh, geographical uh, differences. Uh, I mean, as a project coordinator, I had really had the privilege to be able to talk at the same level with uh, with political uh, representatives of the cities and uh, administrative people. And sometimes I also myself understood that uh, it's not the case between those two persons mm. uh, but again it really also depends on the countries where you are there are countries where administrative uh, issues are really really um, hard and heavy and it takes time and it takes a lot of people in between but there are also um, there are also countries where these things are going quite directly so it often also probably is a, a a problem of personality and uh, geographical differences, I would say. And uh, I'd be happy. Uh, I'd be happy to know how to overcome that. Yes. Now, um, moving on, Jevon, Jevon's paradox uh, says that when we save energy, paradoxically, we just end up, in fact, consuming more. In practice, um, can you seriously expect households and businesses who also have to come on board with this? to reduce their energy use, given the paradox? How do we transcend the paradox? Uh, well, my first reaction would, to be, would be to say that uh, we have no choice anyway. <laughs> so how to do it is really uh, the core of, uh, of all the interrogation that I've experienced at the city level. Um, how to get people on board uh, but and I understand that there is uh, this rebound effect. Uh, maybe that's exactly what you mean. Yeah. Uh, and I think it base and and that's often the a kind of um, how do you call that when you a dead end street where people in the cities are doing stuff and they are expecting people to come to come along and uh, they are putting projects together and in the end people uh, spend somewhere else the money they saved uh, in the one place. Yes, exactly. And that yeah. expenditure results in energy expenditure. Yeah, sure. Um, I have no secret for that. Uh, I think, and that's also something that came up out of the whole work we've been doing, the whole discussions we had uh, during our project. Uh, um we live in a society uh, which has certain values uh, and uh, I think that all the aspects at society level should, should be um, ready to undertake these energy efficiency measures. Uh, and I would say we should even also need rules that really make uh, energy price the price it is really is in the end taking into account uh, environmental uh, um, uh, consideration and this is something that can be measured and uh, employed but um, governments have to be ready to to tax and to go that way uh, but I, that's one thing but on the other side we have to i think 
the key lies in changing mindsets, uh, maybe even changing values. Uh, I mean, we have probably to go from, from having to being, uh, from quantity to quality, from more to enough. Uh, and yeah, I think that's, uh, that really, uh, that really is, uh, a point where we really have to work because we always come down to this point yeah, <laughs> in any nice in any uh, sustainability issues uh, which we are talking about and yeah changing uh, that changing is the most difficult things for human being <laughs> no finally then what what are the next steps for the program um well, what we'd like to do is uh, first go on with uh, practical implication of all those ideas that came out, uh, all the all the visions that came out within the the roadmaps that were developed at the city level, and we hope to find support for that. Um, we hope that partner cities, pilot uh, cities, will be able to uh, put into place these transversal policies uh, to really deepen the local dialogue. I think again that's goes back to what we just talked uh, how to change how to uh, how to do that with uh, with the local players and um, from from a broader perspective at energy cities we really like to keep on uh, with this imagine initiative and really be able to provide a, a platform for dialogue at European level on energy and sustainability issues at cities level where we are closing officially the the financing of this project uh, this year so we have already um, we have already materials uh, pub pub um, this is uh, um, uh, the handbook we have published um, as an out as main output of the imagine project uh, it's um, it's a it's called low energy city policy handbook on the one side here you have um, uh, case studies about the policies about the the eight pilot cities um, showcasing what their roadmaps ha are uh, what's the vi what is the vision that they have uh, um, developed and also um, in for them uh, a perspective by our academic partner which has been following uh, what the cities were doing and um, if you take it out uh, over on the other side it's a two-way book uh, you have a kind of a, a guide book for implementing um, uh, methods